recording to the cloud. Hello, hello. Welcome to our session. The session is called Performing Truths as Responsible Anthropology of Education. And I am delighted to have two of our panelists be able to be here today, two or three of us out of five. We had unexpected and um, COVID related uh, challenges with scheduling, but here we are. So I will, we, each of us will introduce ourselves and um, to honor the wonderful disability uh, requirement of our, of our uh, Anthropology Association. We'll introduce ourselves with our physical looks and background. If we hold anything up, we're supposed to say what it is if you point to something or have a visual. And then we have just some basic questions for each of us to answer about what it means to have performance as part of our anthropological scholarship in the field of education. So without further ado, my name is Melissa, uh, Melissa Conman Taylor. I use the pronouns she, her, and hers. Many people call me Misha. So you'll see on my screen, I have the nickname Misha, uh, which has a no whole other story that could take the entire 40 minutes. We won't go there. And um, I am wearing an uh, all black shirt. Uh, which has some graphics that I don't think you can see, some loopy earrings. I have brown hair that is curly and I am an aging white female. Um, I'm in an office with a door behind me and a bookshelf and big messes and my new book, which I hope I'll get to talk about in that yellow cover on the shelf behind me. And I'll pass it on to Yelena. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Yelena Indarava. Um, I am a light-skinned female, uh, brown hair, blue eyes, uh, navy blue dress uh, with light blue stripes, um, purple chair in the back that I'm really proud about. It's my throne, uh, some bookshelves in the background, um, and there might occasionally be a puppy that shows up um, in the frame. Uh, I go by she, her, hers, um, and um, I'm an assistant professor uh, of social foundations at Auburn University. Ellen? Sure. Um, hi, my name is Ellen Skilton, and uh, I am joining you from Philadelphia today. Um, I am also um, an aging white female um, with glasses on, uh, sort of roundish glasses, um, shoulder length curly hair. And I'm wearing a lot of purple today, um, purple flowers um, and then a purple sweater. Uh, also, lots of books in the background. <laughs> that seems to be um, one of the requirements. <laughs> and um, I use she, her, hers pronouns. And I am a professor at Arcadia University and also the faculty director of the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Mentoring. And I'm so pleased to get to be here today. Oh, how wonderful. I'm so glad we're all here. And I'm so looking forward to learning with each of you. I am at the University of Georgia where I'm professor of education, but I also have some, I don't know, underlying, overlying status, liminal status in the um, art education or art school, Lamar Dot Art School. And I often work with the um, theater students, especially those who are in theater education, because we don't have a uh, theater education certification or anything like that in, in our state, really. Um, so the first question based on that, I think we're, we're together because somehow theater performance improv, you'll tell me what drew us all together. Mm -hmm. So the, the question for each of you and for myself as well is to discuss the ways in which performance or theater or improv has been a part of our educational inquiry or, and or our artistic work um, and to discuss the directions of that work. So um, would Ellen, would you like to take it away? Sure, I can try. Um, I, I was very much a thespian in um, my high school days. <laughs> um, theater was a huge part of my life. Um, and that um, it was true in college too. And then I, I left it for a while. Um, and I think what brought me back to theater and certain kinds of performance um, really had to do with the limits of um, reading and writing as a reflective practice for students who were having um, cross-race and cross-cultural experiences and trying to reflect on them. So my, my return to theater <laughs> um, really was through Theater of the Oppressed um, and through thinking about how, how we might 
help students who've had an embodied experience. They've studied abroad or they've done an internship in a, a location where they've really engaged with people from very different backgrounds than their own. To have the reflection experience actually be as embodied or at least somewhat as embodied as the experience itself. Um, I kept having semesters where I would read students final reflections about those experiences and think, oh, there has to be more. <laughs> there just has to be more. Um, and so it's been kind of thrilling to have had a chance both in my teaching and in my scholarship to invite theater into the classroom and invite theater into um, trying to understand um, in particular of late, trying to help um, understand how especially white students and white faculty begin to think differently about whiteness and um, race in the United States, um, not from a sort of distant analytical, um, uh, that doesn't really involve me kind of perspective, but in a way that we are engaging in scenes that members of the classroom community um, or the wider community um, experiences people have had with oppression or um, injustice and then bringing those scenes alive. Um, and um, later, maybe, well, maybe I should talk about it now. Um, uh, Misha and I both have um, a background in educational linguistics. Um, and so I flirt with <laughs> um, the language aspects of my educational anthropolog anthropological work um, come in and out of the frame, depending on who I'm being. Like, am I being an educational anthropologist? Am I being an applied linguist? Am I being, um, I'm, I'm in the process of getting an MFA. Am I being a poet? Am I, <laughs> um, so multiple identities, but I just had a chance and I'll, I'll describe this book, but I had a chance to contribute a chapter to um, a book called Extending Applied Linguistics for Social Impact, um, where, um, and it's a, it's a fantastic cover. I don't know where the image cover image comes from, but it's a like a painting where you can see um, the, the hand and the mouth of a person speaking. Um, and so the goals, and it's a blue book, <laughs> um, but the goals of this um, edited volume were to bring together people who were, engaging in um, applied linguistics in ways that people might not think are applied linguistics. So I went the sort of furthest from language of any of the contributors to say, I'm talking about communication in ways that aren't just about language um, and really um, talking about other semiotic tools like gesture and movement um, and really looking at particularly at some of the, um, the theater of the oppressed work that I've done with students specifically around race um, and how that work seems to provide opportunities for um, even having white folks see race for the first time um, in a way that we've been socialized not to. So that um, performative element, the, the embodied elements of it have I think led to um, conversations that I've never gotten to have before um, in a classroom. And, um, in terms of my scholarship, new ideas about how we might dismantle some of those um, systems. So I'm going to stop there. <laughs> um, Gorgeous. That's, that's how, how it's intersecting right now. Wow, that's awesome. All right, Yelena, tell us about your experience, past to present, <laughs> whatever you can fill with this too <laughs> short time. All right. Um, well, so um, my journey uh, started out with a research project where I was looking at educational reforms in Russia. Um, and I remember collecting data, doing ethnographic work, trying to understand what's happening with teacher education reforms um, and writing in my research journal, this all feels like theater. Everybody's on stage, everybody's performing and everybody's frustrated because it's theater. <laughs> And, um, you know, I returned uh, from the field um, and tried to analyze the data with the frameworks that I had and nothing was coming together um, until eventually I came back to that entry and thought about how, no, actually it is theater um, and theater is so much more helpful um, as an analytical framework to understand what's happening here. Um, and so I turned to the works of Goffman, uh, Brecht, uh, Gidebor, 
um, to kind of question the assumptions that people bring to thinking about policy, thinking about reforms. Um, and I used uh, these theoretical frameworks to really denaturalize uh, the kind of the assumptions of linearity and rationality uh, that people bring to these processes. Um, and as, you know, on a very basic level, right? Like most people think about doing research on education and policy and they think about those who are in power. So who do you interview to understand what's happening? Well, the minister of education, if it's the country that has a minister of education, or you go to the uh, department uh, of education, state department of education or so on. Um, well, through my work, I actually figured out that the actors that you see on the stage are not necessarily the actors that are preparing the scripts for policies. Mm -hmm. And those who are preparing the scripts are invisible and therefore not accountable to the audience. Um, and so folks assume that if administrations change right in the United States uh, from moving from Bush to Obama, everybody anticipated the education policies would change. Well, the actors on stage change, but the script writers haven't. Um, and so kind of thinking about policy through these lens were very helpful uh, to shed new light uh, on what might be happening in Russia as well as in other countries. Mm -hmm. But most recently, I've actually moved to thinking about how theater can be helpful for understanding what's happening when food service teachers are learning to teach. And similarly to what I've done with the policy work, it's not so much about getting them to do something differently, but it's about denaturalizing the assumptions that we make about these processes through the, lens, uh, through the language of theater. Um, so one of the big conversations in teacher education is how important clinical placements are. It is so important that uh, pre-service teachers spend a lot of time in schools. And I use my work to really question that because when students are placed in schools where the scripts about diverse students are the scripts of pathology mm. and students don't get a chance to question that but are rather introduced in context where they are expected to rehearse these same scripts and perform the same scripts for the mentor teachers and so on then it only intensifies the inequities that we're experiencing. So we advance the clinical placement as the solution for practical problems, and we are not paying attention to the fact that we are recreating the very same problems. Um, so for example, you know, I, I conducted ethnographic work in a school in, um, in a Southwest state, let's say it this way, and it was an urban context. Um, a lot of uh, students who were uh, language learners, uh, Latinx students, um, and it is predominantly white students. And so they, uh, predominantly white pre-service teachers. Um, and so they would work with students and enact very limited understanding of what's happening um, or deficit perspectives. But because they're in context where those deficit perspectives are the core of what happens in the schools, they were never questioned, they were never challenged, and they never moved past those understandings because that's the script that is you know, embedded um, in the grammar of schooling in that context. And so the same student could work with white students and challenge their thinking and ask them to think more uh, or provide more answers. And again, the same pre-service teacher would work with cultural and linguistically diverse students and just provide the answers for them and write the answers um, for, for those cultural and linguistically diverse students. Um, and I use the language of theater to think about how, you know, Stanislavski's work about learning to become an actor sheds light and how, you know, they enter a space and they try to create a role for themselves with the resources available in that space. And they're performing something for the audience that expects to see something, right? So if a mentor teacher, you know, enforces, we can only speak English and we will not allow any other languages in this classroom, then the pre-service teacher placed in that context will enact the same script of monolingualism and of pathologizing diversity. Um, so that's kind of the work that I've been working on. And I've just, again, been really thankful for the, the language that theater offers, right? And I love Bertolt Brecht's work about denaturalization and estrangement, right? You can enter a space and you can just look at it and take it as a given, or you can enter a space and create distance between that space and yourself and say, no, but what's really going on here? And so theater has been really helpful for me for that. Mm 
So Misha, how about you? Will you tell us about your work? Can I just say one connective thing before we, uh, we turn over to Mich Misha to have the, the to enforce the conversational tone? I, I just want to say, wow, that's so fantastic to hear. And like one of the things I think I forgot to say is that this course, this power of play course, um, improvisation and learning is a required course for our pre-service teachers. And in addition to what you're saying about learning scripts, which is just so thought provoking, um, that we really have come to see how much of teaching is improvisation. And that in a time when we act like um, teaching can be just scripted in a book, <laughs> right? Um, that it's been really powerful to use the language, as you were saying, the language of theater, not just the um, engagement with theater, but the language of theater to talk about what teaching and learning is and that improv is everywhere um, in teaching and learning. So, sorry, Misha. Back to you, but I got too excited to not say um, yes. And teacher education has lots of, I think, ways in for um, the language and experience of theater. Yes, and that's my yes, whole. And. <laughs> that's my whole term. Yes, and so I, I couldn't agree more. I, I've, I'm energized by both both of what you've talked about. Um, I like Ellen started deeply with an identity as a theater person and an artist. I was. Um, uh, I guess, you know, for various reasons drawn into uh, all kinds of ensembles as a younger child and then into college. And I left my program at Tufts University um, where many famous actors and singers and performers had also graduated from. And my peers who were in the theater community, I graduated with a, a, a major in Spanish and Latin American studies. So I was always committed and taking classes, uh, for example, with a wonderful romance language professor who introduced us to um, Teatro Campesino and Bread and Puppet Theater and Augusto Boal and all of these ways in which theater could be um, used towards agency and acting up and empowerment. And I, I applied um, with those skills to Teach for America, which was in its infancy. And the rest of my friends seemed to be going to New York City to the Tisch School of the Arts or other places like that. But I didn't have the funding to do that. And I also had already developed a very strong commitment to using my bilingual Spanish English skills to meet um, needs and to return the kindness that I had experienced um, living with my family in Mexico City during my year abroad. So I it seemed to be a natural fit when they were recruiting for teachers um, who didn't have certification to go into the teaching profession, uh, sign me up. So I was placed in 1992 in South Central Los Angeles, just after the Rodney King um, uh, violence had happened. Uh, the, the city was on fire um, and I arrived with my naive, uh, you know, glass half full kind of perspective that I could make change. And it was just like you said, Yelena, where I was suddenly, uh, one day I remember having a crisis in my classroom. I, I was just exhausted. I was I, without a certification, but they had emergency certification in LA. So I would teach all day, drive from South Central to East Los Angeles for my certification classes. And I just lost it one day. And I went to the teacher's room and there was this older uh, white woman colleague. And I said, I don't, I'm really, I'm lost. And she took out her stack of coloring pages. And she told me that the trick to getting through teaching was to give them coloring pages and to tell the kids to color very slowly in between the lines. <laughs> so I was horrified that day. That's a powerful script. <laughs> yes. That day, you bet you, I gave the, the coloring page, but I said, by, you know, I needed that break, but I, it, I couldn't stomach that other teachers were operating like that on a daily level with these beautiful people in their rooms. And that was just one of many incidents. So then I, I transformed. I thought, you know what, there's a place for theater in schools to empower um, younger teachers, to enable uh, rehearsals of creativity in moments of great struggle and triumph. So I drew a lot of inspiration from Augusto Boal, um, a, a great deal of, of inspiration from Irving Goffman, the people you've mentioned, Brecht. Um, I had been in shows you know, about the misanthrope, the man who hated people. And I was inspired by playwrights 
And then early in my teaching, Anna Devere Smith had her, sh her one woman show Twilight and I got to see its opening um, in the same space where I would every year I'd get free tickets for my, take my kids to the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. And then I got the tickets as a teacher to see her perform this show that was based on 300 or so interviews with all of us stakeholders in the Rodney King race, uh, the riots with the police officers and the Korean shop merchants. And she boiled it down into this performance, one woman performance that was just outstanding. And I thought there is the intellectual rigor, the practice of theater. This is going to help me, um, you know, help me make a difference in these two fields to which I was committed and passionate throughout and to find those articulations. So because we're holding up books, Yelena, you got to hold up yours. When I know I, got, I need to get mine. <laughs> you got to get yours. You feel free. I'm going to hold up this one. This was my, as a new professor, um, I had a group, I had, we had a, uh, I had the lucky good fortune of working with Dr. Betsy Rhymes and uh, together we had a grant from the Department of Education to recruit more bilingual adults into teaching, but it was really clear very quickly that it's not enough to place a bilingual adult with no experience into the classroom and make change without also helping uh, rehearse the, the kind of stamina and courage required. So this book is um, based on that and that was published in 2010 and it's a black cover with a image of lots of smiling teachers on their backs laying down looking up at the camera. And that was written with Mariana Soto Manning. And then more recently this year, this COVID year, I'm celebrating this new book with my um, former student, now professor Kathleen McGovern. And the book is Enlivening Instruction with Drama and Improv, a guide for second language and world language teachers. And it's really just taking it a bit further. I've, I've developed a, a, a habit for improv comedy. I just love what it does to me. Uh, I love what, watching um, improvisers on stage. And I think that like you just both discussed, it's so essential for teachers to develop that quick footed kind of menu of options for performing themselves. So we do this in a way that distills it for language teachers that you don't have to have a whole lot of fluency to be able to um, play a very simple, enjoyable improv game that will, in doing so, leave an embodied impression of language and engage in repetition in ways that are just delicious. So this is not, uh, not, not done. We have some other questions and time is so brief. So I, the next, uh, I'm going to merge them. You know, the theme of the conference is on performing truth and responsibility. So the, the question is to wrestle with um, aspects of truth or fiction in the ways in which you've done your work and maybe any setbacks or challenges that you've experienced in, in merging these either metaphors or actual fields with education, theater and education. So um, I guess we started with Ellen last time, maybe Yelena, do you wanna start answering the truth fiction? I mean, you've already begun in many ways. Yeah, so that, that was my point of entry. Um, and again, with ed policy work, one of the critical moments for me was um, I would interview powerful actors and they would all give me the same story. We need education reforms because the quality of teacher education is so low. And they would give me the same statistics. Um, and with any good qualitative research, it's a saturated theme, right? All participants are saying the same thing. Um, and I was not satisfied with that because I also saw other perspectives on this issue. And I realized that it was a constructed narrative. Right, that narrative of failure that we also see pushed in the United States as well, right? That, you know, those who have power and those who have the resources continually blame public schools and colleges of education for perpetual failure. Um, and so I ended up adopting this role of a joker, right? <laughs> the one that pretends not to know and just really kind of goes around and goes around and pokes around. And it really helped that uh, people who I was interviewing then were much older than me. And so they kind of looked at me like it's this goofball that could never figure anything out. Um, and I started realizing that, you know, the front that I was given um, was very much a rehearsed performance that they needed to kind of get across to their audiences to justify what they wanted to see changed. Um, when in reality, there were a lot more doubts and that they themselves, the reformers themselves were 
uh, very skeptical about the tools that they were using because they knew that nobody cared about international assessments. Nobody cared about any of those metrics that they were trying to use to justify the changes that they wanted to see. Um, and so again, as a joker, I was able to document that and really question and challenge, you know, what's being presented on stage as, as a theatrical performance. Um, and, you know, with the ethnographic work with teacher education programs, you know, there's something about uh, ways in which teacher education programs talk about commitments to diversity, uh, right? And how, you know, there's this assumption that we've incorporated a diversity course, right? And, oh, and there is a course on teaching language learners. Uh, surely we have now fulfilled our requirement to show how much we're making a difference. Um, and so again, with the ethnographic work, I, I had one particular instance where I was observing and the principal showed up um, at the door um, and uh, said, here's a new student. It was September 15th or 20th, you know, the school has already started many weeks past the beginning. And so the student walks in, this is third grade. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the principal says nothing about the name, nothing about who or what they, the principal just says, yeah, it's another yellow and just walks away. Um, and then what I see happening is the student, the new, new student gets placed in the corner. Um, no one comes up to ask her name. No one comes up to ask anything about her. Children are doing math. Um, it is clear she cannot follow exactly what's happening in the classroom. And the university supervisor walks in to observe the pre-service teacher. And so the university supervisor says, oh, I see a new student. Uh, what language does the student speak? And the pre-service teacher responds, oh, I think Chinese. <laughs> And so it's this very tiny instance of exactly like you said, Nisha, where there would have been great to have actual tools to navigate the situation of how do you find out the student's name? How do you find out their language? How do you provide support if they are a newcomer? And, you know, immediately, you know, the attention shifts to the student that so far has been ignored. Um, other third graders are coming up and what do they do? They immediately start speaking Spanish. Okay, so she does not speak Chinese, she speaks Spanish. And again, the mentor teacher says, we do not speak Spanish here. They leave the student alone and they walk away, right? And so here is the disruption of commitment to diversity and commitment to equity, where the most equitable thing and the most ethical thing would have been to continue the conversation in Spanish, to make the student feel comfortable, to incorporate her, make sure that there's somebody assisting her, right? Like all sorts of things that could have been done both by the mentor teacher, but also by the pre-service teacher and the university supervisor involved in all of this, right? But even though on surface, we make commitments to equity and diversity, and even though on stage, there's this message of, we're gonna make sure that we disrupt the deficit script. Mm -hmm. In the moment, those very scripts were reenacted and re repeated to, damaging effects, right? Because I would return to that classroom on and on and on and on. And I would always see the student isolated on her own. And because she was quiet and because she was not disruptive, it was so easy to ignore her mm -hmm. and just pretend that she's not even there. Um, and that's the kind of truth that breaks her heart. And I think that's the, the moment where I find theater so important, right? To bring back this, this instance where the humanity of the student is being lost. She has just become an object in that classroom for no good reason. And so how do we tell the truth of that instance um, to disrupt this narrative of pathology, to disrupt this narrative of making some students invisible um, because of state policies or whatnot um, that make people assume that that's okay to do this. Mm -hmm. So that has been my engagement with truth and fiction. Mm, so beautiful. Um, Ellen, with your permission, I'm going to leap because I'm having a moment. Uh, <laughs> we, we had a guest speaker here many years ago, Joni Alomu Jones. She's a um, theater professor and Black Studies professor at University of Texas, Austin. And she came and uh, did a performance of her work, Sista Docta, which records the experience of being uh, an African American faculty in a inhospitable climate to say the least and the it's just a gorgeous work and she had our audience of students and faculty rehearse with her 
it, she said, get into the position of self-defense. So I'm have my arms out and my, my fists out. And she said, you know, this is what you do in self-defense. Ha. Huh. And I put my hand in front of me as like a defense and ha. Huh. And she had us rehearse that. And then to it, she said, say this with me, be careful. Your misunderstandings are dangerous. And we did it together. Be careful. Your misunderstandings are dangerous. And we did this for, I don't know how many minutes of the performance, but I tell you, I have taught that to so many people, my students and audiences in different venues. And you, it's amazing when that comes in handy. Sometimes, you know, to a cousin or a misguided person that comes into my classroom in Georgia, where we are only encour encouraging people to wear masks and encouraging vaccines. And I'll hear something and I'll say, maybe I won't use those hand gestures, but say, be careful, your misunderstandings can be dangerous. You know, be careful, that little girl, that misunderstanding can be dangerous. It can have long-term impacts. That was a very important lesson to me, but it takes a lot. This is, I'm gonna leap into answering the other part of the question for myself and then pass the baton. But the tension in this work is, um, to some extent living in a culture that is so afraid, so dismissive of the arts um, as uh, inessential and silly that doing a kind of movement like that is just um, a distraction for more serious intellectual activity that what we really need to do is talk about things rather than physically playing or embodying a position of resistance or um, creativity but also a society that doesn't have a lot of training in the arts. We're really good at pushing kids into athletics mm -hmm. as young people, but very little time for arts training, except for special kids, kids who are really talented. Mm -hmm. But we don't, in fact, when I was teaching in LA, there was no paid arts teachers. So by diminishing the arts presence in all people's lives, we have de-skilled people in arts abilities, which is to be creative in the moment and, you know, flexible and improv and perform oneself and visual um, multiplicity. And instead we train each other to dismiss that work as extra, unnecessary, um, silly, infantilized, whatever it is. And so um, I'm on a mission, a life's mission to challenge that, but it is difficult, you know, even in you know, to have an academic space, it's so delicious to be with you because you're rigorously thinking and inclusive of the arts as valid ways of knowing, of challenging habits of perception, um, which is, you know, fundamentally something offered by Dewey and Elliot Eisner and, our, and Maxine Green, you know, our great arts thinkers that somehow falls out of um, some of the discourses in, in education and other social science realms, but um, that's a tension I'm and a, con a struggle that I'm willing to face. So I'm gonna pass it on to Ellen and see what you think about truth fiction, struggle, challenge. I have, I have so many words piling up to say at the same time. <laughs> how, how many minutes do I have, Misha? We have like six minutes left, I think. Okay, so, so I have a couple of minutes to yeah. say something, okay. Um, so, um, you ended in talking about perception, and I think that um, in a lot of ways, Yelena's, um, uh, the scene that you um, told us about, the scene, the, um, <laughs> the ethnographic moment that you told us about, is also about perception. Um, and one of the things that really, um, as I was um, writing this chapter that was very much for a linguistic audience, I was so aware about how much everything is performance, like language is performance, as you were saying earlier, right? That, that we can't like, we can't escape performance. Every time we walk into a room, we're performing ourselves, right? Um, and that perception, uh, one, of the, one of the books that really um, had an impact on me when I was doing this work was um, Rosa's book on racio-linguistics and this idea of um, indexical inversion, right? And, and so one of the things that the arguments that um, he makes in that book is just that we've spent all our time in thinking about linguistic diversity, thinking about how do we get people who speak with an accent to speak with less of an accent, um, but actually we're looking in the wrong direction, right? We need to change the perceptions of the hegemonic system, the, 
those of us who carry around those scripts, right? Who act as if the problem is located there. And that's one of the things that I feel like, like the truth of that comes through so powerfully um, in theater. And I'm just gonna quickly give an example of, a, it started as a, a tableau where um, a, a, a non-white student who was also gender fluid was talking about a situation of driving through a mostly white town and being stopped by the police regularly. And so the scene that his group enacted was one where he was being, where they were being stopped. And, um, and the person who was playing the cop in the situation was a young white woman, a pre-service teacher. And when it became time for her to enact what happened in this scene, the truth of this scene, right, which was someone else's experience, she changed the dialogue to not um, offer a citation. She was like, she was like, oh no, I'll, I'll let you go this time. Um, you weren't, you know, um, maybe you weren't speeding, right? And everyone was like, but that's not what happened, <laughs> right? The, the truth of the situation. And when we debriefed with her, she was like, but it was so unfair. It was, it was so unfair. Like I wanted, I wanted to change it. And so like what that did, because it wasn't a discussion, it was like she was being a cop <laughs> at the time was, and, and it was their story of being pulled over was that they said, but that's not what happened. <laughs> um, and so we all had to sit with the discomfort that she couldn't do magic, right? That like the earth requires, <laughs> like white people can't go in and just be like, oh, I'm gonna make that less fair, less unfair right now. That, that part of what we all had to do was sit with how unfair that was, right? And to change our perception, right? That like, oh, I'm sure most cops would just be like, oh, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. And sit with the structural violence of that, the interpersonal violence of that. And for her, her white self, not just her brain, but her emotions and her physical self and all of us in the room that wanted it not to be true, right? <laughs> Had to experience what it felt like for her as the cop to follow through with citing this person for speeding, even though they weren't, right? And I, um, and that's perception changing, right? That's not a dialogue that happens sitting around a table we all felt that in our bodies. And so um, just really aware of like the truth of that, right? That, that you know, what did I say? We, we talk about truth in academic contexts as if it's something erudite and um, uh, it can be objective and, um, you know, we have citations to support it. But the truth of that moment, um, I want that truth to matter <laughs> um, in both um, the teaching and scholarship that we do, because then that's not just a performance of, like, as you're saying, Yelena, like that's not just a performance of the way we should be thinking. That's actually a performance that allows us to live into taking a kind of action that we never imagined we could because we're rehearsing it. Mm -hmm. We're trying it out um, mm -hmm. and, our, and we're bringing our body and our emotions along with us. So, yeah, anyway. and I'll, I'll just say in closing, because we have, we're, our seconds are waning, that we also have to be aware of the fiction that the arts can cure huh. anything, right? I mean, like it's, uh, you know, it, it, these things, what I admire so much in the arts is the discipline and the, it, it, I love playing with applied theater with my students. I think it's giving access to the to arts practices. But what I worry about them coming away with is that they've had a feeling, a big feeling, and it's they leave feeling better, feeling bigger than themselves. But then it's a small part of the existence that goes back to we go back to normal and back to regular classes. And I'm hoping that the people who are with us listening might follow some of the citations that we've talked about or maybe look up some of the writings that we're referring to and take it the next step further and um, continue this rehearsal to, to be better with each other in the human and non-human world. I think we may be out of time. Whoops.
Oh, yes. Yeah, the last one that mentioned teacher education reform is political theater. Uh, cute little cover Russian artist. I think it's called a concert. But yes, pretty much the performance on stage with someone else in the background. It's so My good. Last good to toss in. <laughs> oh, it's, and it's award winning book. Uh, so good, so good. Congratulations on that COVID publication or near COVID. I don't know, right? Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I'm going to stop recording.